Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 386 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by from Pittsburgh, PA, Fast Eddie Chambers. Chambers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's good, Joe? Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for you to finish. <laughs> I'm good, though, Joe. How you feel today, man? You, you all right? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Now I'm speaking to you. I feel energized. Um, that was yeah. my um, very poor version of uh, David Diamante there. But... No, no, I liked it. I liked it, man. That was good. You know, that was good. You're too Keep kind. it up. You're too kind. <laughs> But moving on to the review part of the show, we're going to waste no time. We're going to start here at the Karen Demirchian Sports Complex in Armenia. Uh, it was on Friday the 3rd, last Friday. Murat Gassiev returned to the ring. Again, I said it on last week's show, he's been grossly inactive. About six rounds of boxing in about, I think it was about four years or something since since the, the, uh, the loss to Usyk. He returned to the ring, like I say, now 30-1, and one, a... A very um, suspicious-looking knockout in round two against the undefeated American Mike Balagun, who is now 20-1. and one. Um, A lot of people were looking at the replay saying that it looked like Gassiev kind of motioned fit for um, Balagun to move to his left and Gassiev's right, right before he hit him with a, with a right hand and put him down. And, yeah, it was... I mean, I, I didn't think it was... Um, you know, I'm not trying to say it was suspicious for me but that's just the word on the curb at the minute but I didn't see too much wrong with it but whatever you know it is what it is um it was for the vacant WBA intercontinental heavyweight title um moving out now to the Ruhr Congress in Bochum Westfalen Germany over here the undefeated Ajit Kabayel now 23 and 0 still undefeated um, he was able to TKO in round three, Agron uh, Smakichi, who's now 19-2. and two. Um, It was for the vacant EBU European heavyweight title, which is actually a belt that Cabiel used to hold, but I believe he vacated it just to end up fighting for it again um, about a year or two years later, whatever. It's, it's been a weird kind of journey that Cabiel's had, like I say, beat Derek Chisora all those years ago, looked real good doing it, and... Um, just hasn't capitalized on it at all and he found himself here fighting for a title he used to own against Agron uh, Smakichi always got to say his surname a bit differently but anyways um I didn't see the fight but from what I heard in in round two it was like round of the year type stuff both guys were throwing everything and Caballero was you know staggered into the ropes he looked like at one point apparently the referee was going to jump in and stop it and you know he came back I think and and um I believe, snapped the head back of Smakichi in the final seconds and then came out in round three and dropped Smakichi once and then he got back up and then I believe he, um, you know, forced a, a, a referee stoppage after that. So Caballero, it was uh, quite ex- exciting while it lasted, it, it would appear. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just don't know what he's doing, to be honest with you. I really don't. Um Apparently he makes quite quite a lot of money outside of the ring, so he doesn't need to box as such. So maybe that explains a little bit of it. But anyway, that's that. Moving now to the Newcastle Arena in Tynham Ware, United Kingdom. This one over here was, in the end, televised on Fight TV. Um, I did what I think a lot of other people did. Signed up for Fight Plus, which is like a subscription. £8 something per month. But you get a seven-day trial, so, you know... I think a lot of people signed up, watched the event, and then cancelled it immediately afterwards. Um, 
yeah, on the card, let's go through it here. We saw um, Thomas Patrick Ward lose his O. 33-1 with a draw. He got in there with Otterbeck Kolmatov, who's now 11-0 with 10 KOs. Um, Thomas Patrick Ward down in round one, down in round four, and down in round five. And his corner ended up throwing the towel in. Um yeah, you know, I said on last week's show, Komatov was a little bit of an unknown quantity. He was the favourite with the bookies, obviously being an Uzbek, being a puncher. And I'd said it on so many previous shows that Thomas Patrick Ward, I just I just don't understand his career. It's been so strange, you know. Um, uh, let me just talk about the fight briefly. I mean, like I say, Ward down in round one. I think he, he did quite well to get through that round. He came out in round two and probably won the round. And maybe even won the third round. But yeah, like I say, he's down again in round four, down again in round five. Um, and the towel comes in. But yeah, a lot of people were very impressed with the Uzbek. Rightly so. You know, I can't wait to see him back in some other big fights down the line. Definitely, he showed some potential and some promise to be a formidable fighter in the near future. But like I say, back to Ward. I just, uh, you know, I feel like this is a bit harsh. But I want to say, like, he's like a huge waste of talent, I'm starting to think. You know, loads of fights against nobodies. You know, got himself to 30 odd and oh. And doing that, padding out your record, I think, Eddie, and I'll come to you about this, actually, because this is a guy, just to paint the picture, you're probably not familiar with him, but he got to 33-0 with a draw. He was world-ranked for ages, but for whatever reason, didn't have a big promoter behind him, couldn't land a big fight, but he kept having all these fights padding up his record. Now, it's great for fighters that can punch. You know, you can bang these nobodies out within a round or two. Deontay Wilder is the perfect example. You know, you can't get much worse opposition than what they fed Deontay Wilder when he was coming up. He didn't have any miles on the clock after about 35-odd fights. As for this guy here, though, Thomas Patrick Ward, he goes the distance almost every time. He's only got a couple of knockouts, and therefore he's got loads and loads of miles on the clock. And I think that this may be it for him at this level, sadly. I think he had so much to offer when he first turned pro. I don't think he's the same fighter that that, that he was. I, I've noticed a bit of a slip a few fights ago now. But this guy was a really good amateur. Um, I, I'm not sure if he wants to continue with his career being you know involved in domestic fights but anyway back to what i'm saying eddie can you understand that this guy was a real good amateur turn pro with a lot of promise but because he's not a puncher he ended up putting miles on the clock going the distance with 30 different guys whereas wilder did something very similar but was able to erase those guys within a round or two therefore he didn't have loads of mileage on the clock when he got in those big 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 tough fights at the top that's that's a fact a lot of guys do that early on, even myself. I mean, don't get me wrong. I had a little a couple of tough fights early on too, to kind of, you know, get you to graduate to a certain level and to, you know, just see how it feels. You understand what I'm saying? Being in here with certain guys, with certain styles, you know, you know, heights, uh, strength, power, you know, different things that you might need to improve. But uh, one tomato can after another is really not going to do it for you. What will happen is you'll get – to a certain level, your record will be really, really, really big, but you'll still, you'll be missing some of that seasoning. You know what I'm saying? And especially if you're not a puncher and you're going to distance constantly, it's even, it's going to be even harder to, to, to improve in situations like that. You know what I mean? So, um, with, with, and like you said, with Wilder, he was getting the guys out 30 seconds. And then most people were saying, well, once he gets to a, higher level i might have been one of those one one of those guys that said it once he gets to a higher level those knockouts are going to come as easily we just didn't know wilder had that that crazy knockout power at that level even i mean at that at that time and at that level that it would even graduate to the next level with him you know what i mean but it did which is great for him but a guy like this who doesn't have the power who is supposed to have a real high level of skill but no power, even at the even at the next uh, at at the beginning level, in the pros is going to spell difficulty because once you get to a certain point, your power that you might have if you already had it is going to be tough to 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 extend. Like even if you look at guys like um, 
I was my man's name. Uh, ah, Keith Thurman. Keith Thurman was knocking everybody out early on, you know, as he was coming up. But as, you know, the, the better the competition gets, the harder it is to knock the guys out. So with this guy, and it doesn't seem to be getting that much better, he's going to struggle, or obviously he's already struggling. So, I mean, I don't know where his career is going to go from here, but, uh, you know, I'm hoping for I'm hoping for the best for him. But uh, he might hit a, a real rough patch or already has over these next couple of fights. Yeah, like I say, all the best to him. Um, 33-1 and one now with a draw. He's got five KO wins. Um, yeah, I mean, he's in, a t- he's in a tough spot. I think he's actually missed the boat now. Um, there's a few guys that I can remember that kind of come up in my mind, you know, that are in similar positions. Um, Dusty Hernandez Harrison probably being one, a guy that, you know, really padded out his record. He was world-ranked and then, you know, did it all for nothing, really. He's still undefeated. Oh, you're coming back in. Go on. Yeah, yeah. I, I got one guy, man. I swear. And this was probably – I got two, actually. Uh, one was from Pittsburgh and one it was from Philly. One was uh, – his name was uh, Farouk Salim. And you might you might have heard of him, Joe. I'm not sure. But uh, he had – I don't know. He was like 36-0 and 0 at one point. But I think he hadn't fought a guy in the top 50 or something like that, not even in the top 100, I don't know. And he was just really padded, really horribly padded record. And then one time brought a guy in who was a trial horse or a guy that you're supposed to knock out. What happened? He ended up getting beat. Then another guy, and this is another way that this can go really, really bad, is a guy that we, I know from Pittsburgh, his name was Ralph, Ralph the Tiger Jones, right? Had a horribly padded record. We're talking 0-1, you know, 2-10, and 10, uh, two and five, oh, you know, one and five. Oh, nobody with a winning wet record. So, and I think he was around 147 or 140. I think it was 147. So, guess what happened? Got an opportunity to fight uh, up, up, up and coming star. That star was Ike Bazooka Corte. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll take that fight. Biggest payday he ever had, but he got destroyed, and his career was over after. So that padded record thing can really work against you in a lot of ways. And in that situation, it changed the course of this guy's life. So you really have to really pay attention early on with, I mean, this is, this is if you're a manager, promoter, or whatever, and a fighter, to really think about your how far you can go and what that padded record situation can really do, do for you or do to you. It's, it's, it's something that's really important. You need to be tested. You need to know where your ceiling is. As you as you uh, as you uh, ascend in your career, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, Farouk Salim was was a bit of a banger, but yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, Thomas Patrick Walters has done um, 229 rounds and hasn't boxed anywhere near world level yet, which is just crazy. But anyways, it is what it is. Let's move on. We've given it too much time. Uh, Lee McGregor on the card as well. Now 12-0 and 0 with a draw. Return to the ring after about a year out of it. He got him there with the extremely teak tough Alexis Cabor from Burkina Faso, who's now 29-8. and eight. Of course, it went the distance. It went eight rounds. Uh, but um, Alexis Cabor hasn't been stopped since his debut 19 years ago. He wasn't ready to get stopped again here. Took some good shots. Didn't really look hurt at any point. Uh, did well, actually, as well. Um, don't know if he won any rounds, but, you know. Uh, gave it to McGregor at times, hit him with some decent shots. He's he's a tough old guy that that Cabor. Um, elsewhere on that that was a really uh, nice uh, free bit of money I think as well on the points for uh, Lee McGregor. Uh, what else did we have on the card? Yeah, l- the main event. Lewis Ritson now twenty three and three. He was knocked out in round nine by O'Hara Davies. Now twenty five and two. Um, it was a left uh, left hook to the body. Um, round one, I gave to O'Hara Davies. Round two, I gave to O'Hara Davies. I felt the round was quite close. Ritson did land some lovely body shots, but nothing to discourage Davies, really. Um, 
for me, I did think he just about nicked the round, Davies. Round three, a massive O'Hara Davies round. Um, he was piecing Ritson up with big right hands to their head, you know, starting to open up, get through that guard. Round four, I gave to Davies. Round five, I think, was a better round for Ritson, maybe a Ritson round. Round six was a Davies round, massive round. He hurt Ritson to the body badly. Ritson was in big trouble with the long left hooks to the body from O'Hara Davies. And I felt at that point it's O'Hara Davies' fight to lose. Um, round seven, Ritson was again in big trouble through body shots. At one point, he was trapped on the ropes, guarding his body and just taking shots in the head at free will. Um, round eight was a weird one because O'Hara was letting Ritson walk him down a bit and, and lean on him as well. And O'Hara's output dropped dramatically. It was a really weird round for Davies. I gave it to Ritson on activity and despite... O'Hara landing some real peaches in the last seconds of that round. For me, it was a Ritson round, but it was a bit puzzling. I was thinking, wait, is O'Hara maybe running out of gas? Oh, no, no. Then in round nine, O'Hara, like I say, really gave it to Lewis Ritson in that ninth round. Ritson at one point wasn't even throwing. He was just taking shot after shot after shot. O'Hara was taking full advantage, and then he sinks in that beautiful left hook to the body. One of many he'd thrown all night, and down goes Ritson. He gets counted out while he was rolling around the floor in agony. It was an amazing win for O'Hara Davies. Really, really happy for him. He's a guy that was on the show years ago. I always really liked him. I never believed in the bad guy image that he tried to portray. I always kind of knew that he was actually a decent guy from speaking to him. Um, you know, sometimes in boxing, you 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 know you speak to a guy who's supposed to be this villain. You speak to him one on one, and then you go, you you kind of take him back a bit. You go, wow, this this guy seems really cool actually. And I always kind of had that vibe from him. So he hasn't had the easiest of careers, the easiest of of times, the easiest of journeys, but I'm really pleased for him to win this fight. I felt he'd win. I think um, it was close with the bookies, but he was the, the narrow favourite, and um, really pleased for him, really pleased for him. I think hopefully he can he can get a big fight after this, um, but yeah, Ritson was still on the floor about three or four minutes later. He was in big trouble, um, and like I say, ever since moving up to 140, he just, he just is not the same guy. Um, quite an easy win, really, looking back now through the, the entire fight there for O'Hara Davies. So great stuff for him. And like I say, hopefully he can he can get a big fight next. He certainly deserves it. Um, and then moving to the final card to mention, it took place at the Toyota Arena in Ontario, California, USA. Um, it was live on Showtime, if I'm not mistaken. I streamed it. Um, wins on the undercard for Terrell Gaucher, friend of the show, now 23-3 and with a draw. He was able to knock out in the ninth round Brandon Lynch, who's now 12-2 and with a draw. Um, I thought he'd win that quite comfortably, Gaucher, and he did in the end. He was down thrice in round nine. Um... What else did we have? We had Amil Car Vidal Jr., 16-0, and stepping in with the 19-year-old undefeated Elijah Garcia, now 14-0. and He was able to knock out Vidal in round four. Vidal stopped standing on the ropes. That one was for the WBC Latino middleweight title. Good win there for 19-year-old Elijah Garcia, perhaps one to keep an eye on for the future. Uh, not to say that Amil Car Vidal is written off by any means. I think he can come again as well. Both guys punch as both guys exciting. Um, one thing that really wasn't exciting and was a huge disappointment. I don't know if you saw it, Eddie. If you did come in, if you didn't, just stay muted, I guess. Jarrett Hurd, former Unified World Champion, bitterly disappointing return to the ring. Now 24 and 3. I couldn't quite believe it. I mean, he boxed here against um, Jose Resendiz, who had a you know a record of 13 and 1. But I'd looked at it and I thought, nah. He's okay, but he hasn't really beaten anyone, really. His one loss came to Marcos Hernandez. You know, I, I look through the rest of his wins. They weren't against great fighters. Most of them were debutants, you know. And I'm just thinking, this is an easy, easy comeback fight here for Jarrett Hurd, who looked absolutely horrendous last time we saw him almost two years ago against Luis Arias in his move to middleweight. But... I thought he's had two years off. It can go one of two ways, really, can't it? You can come back 
energized, refreshed, and you know, ready to go for that next chapter of your career, or that two years can really show and you can look even worse. And unfortunately, it was the latter of the two. He looked awful again. Um, you know, he come into the fight. Like I say, I thought he was going to win. I thought he could perhaps even get a stoppage, which was two to one, by the way. Um, but yeah, he was he was getting outworked, which is crazy when you consider what Hurd was like a few years ago when he was a world champion. You couldn't outwork him. He'd just smother you and didn't have the prettiest of styles, but he'd be in your face. He had a fantastic chin and he would just keep coming forward and, and just putting the pressure on, man. It wasn't pretty, like I say, it wasn't being it wasn't um hitting and not being hit, but he would just maul you really. And unfortunately, it was him that was on the receiving end really of that kind of style, if anything. Um he tried to you know, box at range at times, which never suits him at all, doesn't work for him, he was losing rounds doing that, there was points early on where I think he might have nicked a round or two, but any round he nicked, he really just nicked, and every round he lost, he lost big, you know, and he was being caught with massive shots from Rosendis, who made Jarrett Hurd honestly look so average, and that potentially could be the end for Jarrett Hurd. I'm not sure I ever want to see him again. I was bitterly disappointed because he messed up my bet big time. And I really, I threw him in there really for, for not much added value to the parlay. And he completely um, screwed it up. Um, but yeah, in the end, he actually gets stopped in the 10th and final round because his lip uh, was cut so badly. I think a piece of his lip was actually missing. No, no problem with that. You know, it is what it is. But before the lip even became a thing, he was losing that fight handily and needed a knockout. And it was it was just such a terrible show there from Jarrett Hurd. Um, the main event, though, this made up for it, thankfully. Brandon Figueroa now 24-1 and with a draw. Never in doubt for me against Philippines' Mark Magseo. Both guys friends of the show. Um, he is now 24-2. and Magseo deducted... De Magseo deducted a point for holding in round 8 and a another point in round 11 also for holding. Figueroa cut in the fourth round on his eye and then cut on his other eye in round 10. Both of those cuts though from accidental head clashes. Um, yeah, <laughs> a really, really good fight. I've seen... You know, we, we said it on last week's show, to be honest with you, Eddie. We said that it could potentially be fight of the year. Um, there are people saying that it, it could potentially be in the conversation. I'm not entirely sure I'd put it in the conversation because I think we've we've had some decent contenders for fight of the year already this year and there's still obviously the majority of the year yet to come but um, anyway getting to the fight Figueroa came out boxing in Southpaw and boxing at range um, again looked a bit strange reminded me of when Sean Porter came out and boxed against Danny Garcia early on in their fight and you could just see that they weren't the right tactics. Uh, Magseo started really well as well. I think he was using his legs, you know, throwing one or two shots and getting out of there. It was really working. Um, and yeah, Steve Farhood as well had it, you know, had it to um, to Magseo early on. But yeah, I, I just think, you know, you don't really need to change anything when it always works for you, for Figueroa. And he did eventually revert back to his old style it was I think in the last 30 seconds of round two is when we saw the first glimpse of it and that's how he boxed for the rest of the fight um, although I had Figueroa win, winning most of those early rounds I could see though that the footwork of Magseo was definitely troubling Figueroa quite a bit um, Magseo like I say really impressed me with his feet just that movement and the, and the fact he just land one or two, maybe three, and get out of there. I felt that, um, you know, it was frustrating Brandon Figueroa. And early on, I was saying to myself, I think Brandon really should be going to the body a little bit in those instances to try and slow uh, Magseo's movement down. Um, I was v I was quite surprised to see Steve Farhood have it four two for Magseo after six rounds. Um, that was a bit mad to me, but like I say, he he liked his early work. Um, in round seven, Figueroa had a huge round. It was uh, it was maybe the turning point in the fight actually because Magseo seemed to present. Uh, seemed to slow down a little bit uh, Magseo was doing a lot of holding as well at that point like I say the referee gave him quite a few warnings I think the referee had 
quite a, a decent performance as well. And like I say, deducted a point in round eight. Uh, Brandon came on strong, in my opinion, pretty much for the rest of those later rounds when Magseo was, was only really fighting in bursts. And yeah, I had it to Figueroa in the end quite wide. I think the judges, the, the, the three judges that scored it, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head how wide they had it. I think there might have even been one that didn't give Magseo a round or maybe might have given Magseo, I think might have given him two two rounds actually because he had two point deduction separately uh, maybe I'm ballsing that up a little bit but anyway it was very wide on a couple of cards I'm not sure I had it that wide but I certainly didn't have it as close as Steve Farhood either so I was somewhere in the middle there but yeah I felt Figueroa was always going to get that decision if it was going to be tight but I don't think it was particularly tight I think he did enough to win and um, yeah like I say if you've not seen Figueroa box before then um, you know it's, it's, it's like that every time. He's always involved in a fantastic fight. Never, ever lets us down. Doesn't matter who his dance, dancing partner is. So, um, yeah, great for him to get another win. But that wraps up the review part of the show. Just before we wrap up part one, the final thing for me to do is to come in with this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated lightweight contender ranked number 11 in the world with a WBA. It is, of course, Ireland's very own Mr. Gary Cully. Gary, welcome to the show, my man. Yeah, thank you for having me on, man. Appreciate your time. Hey, it's my pleasure. I appreciate yours also. So, Gary, it's the first time you've been on, so welcome once again. Very delighted to have you. I want to start with a question I was asked a few weeks ago myself, actually. Someone asked me, why is Gary Cully's nickname the Diva? And I didn't actually know the answer. Where does the nickname come from? <laughs> um, shout out to Lee Eaton for that one. <laughs> Lee Eaton, um, uh, 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 the guy who runs the... I'm sure you know Lee. If you're in yeah, boxing yeah. circles, you'll know who Lee yeah. is... Um, Runs a small house scene around around the UK, but um, he he originally he called me a diva at one show. He was he was um, he was running one of the shows back in Belfast a couple of years ago, and, and he just called me a diva. And it, it started as a joke, and I said I'm coming to the next show with pink shorts with the diva on them, and uh, I showed up with with pink shorts with the diva on them, and it stuck then, and everybody started liking it. And then we we actually. I thought that I, I was the furthest thing from a diva. I suppose in the gym I kind of I kind of am like I have I have certain standards that I like to be set. But uh, over the over since it's been since I've been christened with it, um, a lot of close friends and family have actually said that it suits me really well. That I I, I kind of act like a diva at times as well. So um, people seem to be enjoying it. I like the pink. I like the glitter. I like the I like the diamonds. So uh, yeah, man, it's good. <laughs> That's cool, man. And you, you turned pro in September 2017. You're now 16-0 and with 10 of them quick. Um, I want to touch on a couple of your previous fights. Obviously, um, Victor Kotodjigov... Oh, my God, I'm saying it wrong. Victor Kotodjigov was a good win. I mean, yeah, there we go. You become the only man to stop him. His only other loss came to Maxi Hughes on points. And after that, obviously, you boxed um, Simeon, Viriel Simeon, who was another guy who'd been around the scene, went the distance with Scott Quigg, went the distance with Lee Selby. You became the, the second quickest man to stop him, only outdone by Shakur Stevenson. As fans of the sport, as boxing media, we like to get that infamous measuring stick out and compare the way you beat a fighter with the way another proven top guy's beating the fighter as a fighter though is that something that sticks in your mind also gary yeah for sure and um, for sure it is i was uh, when when i see it when i'm when i get an opponent obviously confirmed and we're, we're in camp we're preparing for an opponent you're obviously looking at his previous previous uh fights and who he's fought the results of them and how they've come and stuff like that and i always try to do the best job possible that I can do and I always try to outdo what anybody else has done. So going into the Katochikov fight obviously knowing that he'd only been he'd only been beaten by Maxi Hughes um on points. I wanted to get him out of there. And obviously I did that and then the Simeon one I, yeah, I, I was up against it I suppose from the start because Shakur got him out in the first round so um it was it was quite difficult to 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 beat that. Um I got him out in the third, so yeah, Shakur out done me there by two rounds. But um, yeah, man, it's always something that you're looking at, especially when these guys are at the top level, like Shakur, and that kind of names are are getting these out. You're trying to measure yourself on 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 what you what what job you can do and and how well you can do it, like you know. Yeah, and the fight after that for me was clearly 
for me anyway, the best win of your career, that stoppage win against Miguel Vasquez. I mean, you become the quickest man to stop him. He may not be the fighter he once was, but in very recent times, we'd seen him over over in the UK getting blatantly robbed on the cards by Lewis Ritson and O'Hara Davies. So there's, again, the measuring stick. Tell me about that fight, though, Gary. Did you maybe even surprise yourself with that outcome? Yeah, I suppose uh, Miguel Vasquez, he'd just come off two wins as well previous to I fought him. He, he just fought in a couple of months before we fought for the for the um, some WBA title. Um, so he won a ranking belt in over in Mexico as well. So he, he was still active, he was still winning. Um, recently, even after my fight with him, he's went over to Germany and got robbed on the cards again last week. Uh, maybe two weeks ago now, but he's still active and he's still he's still winning fights, you know. So he was a uh, he was a dangerous opponent for sure. He like you said, he'd come over to the UK and beaten O'Hara Davis, I, I believe, and beaten Lewis Ritson also, I believe. So um, it was a big test and a big step up at that time for me that I hadn't been in with that level of opponent. But yeah, no, I backed myself and I believe that. I'm I'm right up there with these guys and I can I can beat beat these guys. So um. It wasn't really a surprise for me. I suppose getting them out of there so quickly, I thought uh, I thought maybe we'd go a couple more rounds into into six, seven, maybe eight rounds. I always did think I would I would be able to get them out of there, um, as I went through the gears and and start pushing the pace in the later rounds. But I suppose getting them out of there in the fifth round, it was a little bit sooner than I expected. Yeah, I think that was a fight that a lot of people thought, okay, wow, that's 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 not what's supposed to happen to Miguel Vasquez. I think that yeah. got a lot of people's attention. I think it was after that as well that you got the attention of, of, of Matram. Do you feel like they can take you to the next level? Yeah, I believe I'm in I believe I'm in the best hands possible. I believe I've got the best team around me, the best coaching team, the best managing team, um, the best promoter in the world. I believe every day every 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 um, person, every role on my team is, is it's the best in the world. They're all professional at their job and they're all at the top of their game. So, um, yeah, man, I believe that Macho and Eddie can take me to the next level, can take me to the States and can make me a global star. And your first fight with Matram, I believe, was the Belmedi fight, then the Flores fight most recently. You took out both guys in one and two rounds. Uh, both, uh, you know, respectable fighters. Talk me through that most recent victory, Gary, because I felt that Flores was a bit of an unknown quantity. I didn't really know what to expect from him, but it turned out to be another quick night for yourself. Yeah, it was, it was, suppose it was quite similar to the Belmedi one. These guys were both undefeated guys coming over to to kind of put an end to... to my party and my hype train or, or yeah like everybody's getting excited about the the Gary Cully um the Gary Cully train now and, and these guys were coming over to put an end to it so um two undefeated guys Belmedi French champion 16 and 0 and and Flores 10 and 0 from from New York so these guys coming over from New York traveling over 5 6 hours from the states um undefeated records they're not coming over for nothing they're coming over to win and they know their way around the ring you know but like I said to you, as well as the Vasquez fight, I believe I'm I'm up there with the world level guys, and and I'm levels above these type of French champions, and and um, I think I think um, Flores had just won the Feda Latin or Feda Central, some another WBA ranking belt, but I believe I'm above that level. I believe I'm right up there with these world level guys. I haven't got the experience just yet, but I'm I'm starting to get there. I'm starting to bridge the gap, and it's not far. I'm not far away from uh, from being up there and challenging these guys. And forgive me if you've been asked this question a million times in the past, but you've spoken in the past about your dream fight being against Shakur Stevenson in Las Vegas. However, you guys did do a bit of sparring in a Russian hotel, so I'm told. What happened there, Gary? <laughs> yeah, we were just kids at the time, we suppose, 14, 15. Um, Shakur actually had a broken hand at the time. He was in a cast, so he was... Uh, I was fighting at maybe 60 kg, and he was fighting at 56. And um, yeah, we were we were both just in the in the we were we we're in the same corridor. We were staying on the same corridor as the American team, and we would have been kind of kind of friendly with with the American team, the Irish team, and the American team. We would have chatted a bit. And um, yeah, one of the nights we were doing nothing, and myself and Shakur threw the gloves on and uh, did a couple of rounds of uh, of sparring. Yeah, so it's good memories to have, and to see where he's at now is deadly. Um, I always knew. I, I said that from we've been at, at two tournaments together. As uh, as youths and juniors, and and as soon as I seen him, I always knew that he was going to be a star, and that's what I said to him back then was that 
that we'll uh, we'll fight one day and we'll make a lot of money and we're right on course to doing that. So he's doing he's doing his thing and he's up there at the, with the best in the world now and it's it's up to me to prove that and to. I'm on course to, to do that as well, so um, I believe it's only a matter of time till that dream comes true. Yeah, Shakur, a fabulous fighter. He's been on the show a few times in the past. Um, I wanted to ask as well, Gary, who have you sparred? Preferably not in the hotel corridors, but who are some of the most, the, you know, the most biggest names you've sparred over the years? Um, I've, uh, through the amateur days, I would, would have been in, in in with a with a, a lot of top level guys, you know. Um, Ireland alone, Michael Conlon, the Conlons, uh, David Oliver Joyce, I suppose Katie Taylor when I was when I was just a just a youth coming through the ranks as well. Um, I've done a bit of sparring with Jack Carroll since turning pro, preparing for some of my fights. Um, Gaza Dick and Sean McComb, all these guys in the in in my gym in Dublin as well. Um, so I've been in there with 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 a lot of top level guys. I I suppose more tr- more so. The, the bigger names throughout the amateurs, I would say, um, and then since turning pro, like I said, I've done a couple of rounds with. I've, I've, we've travelled over, sparred Jack Carroll. I've done a lot with Jazza Dickens as well in the gym. Um, yeah, Tyrone McKenna, Sean McComb, all these guys. So um, top top level guys, you know. Yeah, no, fair enough. And, and speaking of Katie Taylor, your next fight was supposed to be on her undercard with Serrano. Um, obviously, it sadly got cancelled. Where does that leave you at the moment, Gary? Yeah, I'm um, not quite 100% sure at the minute. Um, obviously, I believe they're they're looking for a, a replacement, and I'm hoping in my head that the show on, on May 20th still goes ahead. It looks like Katie still wants to... To come home and to fight in Dublin on May the twentieth. Um, I believe Macho are probably trying to find a replacement. I see the the back and forth between herself and Chantel. So hopefully that one can get over the line. And, and I'm still on course to fighting back in Dublin on May twentieth. If not, I believe they're going to go to to Croke Park in September. Um, for the homecoming, for the big homecoming in front in, in front of a hundred thousand. So that will be that will be on my on my hit list but I'll definitely have to get one in before whether it be in the UK or somewhere else in the world um so if it's not dublin i, I I'm, i'd like to be out in in may start of june um and then back in back in ireland for sure some stage at 2023 yeah, because I didn't hear any announcement, obviously, for your opponent on that card. I know you touched on it, saying that you, you know, you need a big fight for that card. Um, it doesn't sound like you were too close to securing one at the moment. But is there anyone on your hit list at the moment, Gary? To, to I fill that position. Everybody and anybody who's going to put me in position to fight for a world title. Um, that's my aim this year. We were. We were uh, negotiating, and I was offered the Maxi Hughes fight when he was with Matchroom. I accepted. Um, I hear that he's gone and, and got a big fight, so um, fair play to him if he has. But that was that was one that was on the radar. I've heard I heard uh, Jorge Linares' name being thrown around as well, which would be amazing if that got over the line. So it's going to be a big fight, and it's going to be a big name. Um, anyone who moves me closer to becoming a world champion is is who I want, and I believe, like I said, I'm in the right hand to do that with with Eddie Hearn and Matchroom. So. And coming down to my final two questions, um, you're world ranked, obviously, like I say, with the WBA, the super champions currently, Devin Haney. Thoughts on him? Um, have you envisioned that fight against him as well? And if so, what happens there? Yeah, Haney's a, a very skillful fighter. Very, very skillful fighter. A fight, a fight that you have to be switched on 100% and concentrated at all times. Um, it's it's a, a a game of chess and a a thinking game with Haney and I believe that's what boxing at the top level is. Um, he's a very very skilled fighter. He's very very quick. Great job. Um, but a fighter I believe I can beat and a fighter that I'll, I'll be aiming to beat. I, I know he's going to move up weight to 140. I've got a little bit of time left at 135. But if our paths ever do cross, it's a fight that I'm very confident in winning. And the regular champion, Javonte Davis, he's announced he's fighting Ryan Garcia April 22nd. How do you see that one going? I think... I think Tank... I think Tank later around. Um, listen, if if Garcia lands early and, and lands that left hook, um, it could be... It could be lights out for Tank, but the same goes for Tank landing on Garcia. So that's why it's such an interesting fight, I think, and that's why so many people are interested in it because they're both very explosive and they've both got power in both hands. Um, I just think that 
Ryan Garcia is a little bit more defensively vulnerable than, than Tank is. I think Tank's a little bit more compact, a little bit more sound. Um, haven't seen him hurt in his career so far, whereas Garcia has been down before. So I think uh, I think Tank takes it in the later round stoppage. Yeah, I think that's a good pick, my man. And just finally, before we let you go, Gary, if you've got any closing words, uh, any closing message just to the listeners, you can say whatever you like before we let you go to wrap things up. Just to keep an eye out, um, get following. If you're not already following, get following. And, uh, yeah, jump on board this journey because it's been a long time coming. I've, like you said, I've turned pro in 2017. It's now 2023, and uh, this is the year where I become a star, I believe. 23 and 24 is the, is the year I, I become a superstar and uh, go over to the States and become a global name. Um, we've seen Conor McGregor do it for, for the Irish MMA scene and we've seen Katie obviously do it for the, the Irish female boxing scene and the Irish boxing scene in general but I want to be the next one to spearhead the the Irish uh, Irish combat sport so yeah um, if you're not already following get on board because it's going to be a, a, an exciting couple of years and I believe it will be again you can follow Gary on Instagram at Gary Cully on Twitter at Boxer Cully uh, but listen Gary it's been a real pleasure speaking with you my man thank you for your time we'll we'll look out for an announcement soon with you and we'll hopefully speak sometime afterwards yeah it won't be too long hopefully next next two three weeks I've got an announcement out there and uh, yeah man I appreciate your time so thank you very much Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. Um, it's it's a sad one, but obviously uh, it's this weekend. It was a little bit late that it was cancelled, but obviously Callum Smith's fight with uh, Pavel Stepien has been postponed and injuries forced Callum Smith out of that fight there. He was going to be the headliner and obviously he won't be fighting now, which I'm sure everyone kind of knows at this point. And it's now going to be uh, the Robbie Davies and Dara Foley fight, I believe, uh, main event. Um, no, sorry, that's going to be co-main. The main is going to be Diego Pacheco and Jack Cullen. We'll get to that. But yeah, friend of the show, Callum Smith, out injured there, which is a big blow to the card, really. Um, in other news, it's a super fight, really. It's, it's a genuine super fight. May the 7th, Stephen Fulton gets in with Naoya Inoue. It's official. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Obviously, Inoue moving up in weight here to... Uh, to um, junior featherweight confuses me that's obviously super bantam isn't it so uh yeah moving up to super bantam there um to take on stephen fulton for the wbc and wbo junior featherweight world titles um yeah it's gonna be a brilliant fight i see a lot of people actually picking fulton here which is really interesting for me because I wonder where a lot of people have him in their pound-for-pound pound list because obviously Inoue is definitely top three or four on most people's lists and I hear a lot of respected people saying they think Fulton's going to win and stuff. So I'm intrigued to know where they've got Fulton on their list currently. But anyways, that's a great fight that's been made. All the best there to Stephen Fulton for end of the show. Um, that's about it really for the... No, there's one other piece of news actually. Um... Super welterweight sensation Sebastian Fandora will be uh, having his next fight against Brian Mendoza, who's also a contender there. It's going to be live on Showtime Saturday, April 8th at the Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson, California. Brandon Lee as well in the co-main with uh, Pedro Campo, which is a bit of a step up there. So that should be good as well. Tickets on sale now for that one. Uh, that is about it, though, for the news. Moving on now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start here in France at the Zenith de Paris. I'm not even going to do the accent. I cannot do French at all. But let's start with the undercard. Um... Over here, the UK's very own Lauren Price. Um, she is having her third pro out in here. 2-0 and currently. She gets in with Naomi Marnez, who is 6-1 and one with four KOs. So perhaps a bit of a puncher. Um, she's from Germany. Her last fight, she actually tasted defeat to the UK's Kirsty Bavington uh, when she came over to Rotherham. She lost to, uh, to, to Ker Kirsty Bavington there. Um, on points but went 10 rounds with her so it's a step up here for Lauren Price also on the card we're going to see Tony Yoka 
um, the Olympic gold medalist, 11 and 1. He gets in with fellow Frenchman Carlos Takam, 39 and 7 with a draw. I think it's a really interesting fight, um, particularly because obviously Tony Yoka lost in his in his uh, last fight against Martin Bacoli, so it's going to be interesting to see how he bounces back. And I just think Carlos Takam's been such a road warrior boxing here, there, and everywhere that I think he's going to be bang up for this fight back at home, you know? Um, you know, obviously 42 years of age now, so he's getting up there in age. And, and um, I, I, one thing that really sticks out to me is that I feel like he beat Arslan Beck Makhmadov last time out. You know, I think he beat him over 10 rounds and got jobbed actually in Canada. So um, seeing him get in here with Tony Yoka, a fight where I think he's going to be bang up for it, back at home, like I say, Yoka coming off a defeat. Yoka not really, I think, even though he's got all the knockouts and stuff, I don't really consider him a massive puncher. I think that this could go to points. And I think that, you know, Yoka points is 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 quite a decent price. And um, what I have seen, which I think is absolutely, absolutely insane, is the price on um, Carlos Takam to win on points. That is 18 to 1. That is absolutely insane. 18 to 1 there for Carlos Takam to win on points. I mean, that's worth, that's worth, you know, a small amount anyway, because obviously Carlos Takam can be busy. Um, and yeah, like I say, I think, I think it's a really good opportunity for Carlos Takam. I really like the fight. Um, elsewhere on the card as well, we're going to see Thomas Four. I think I may be saying that wrong, but he's 21 and four with a draw. Um, only two KOs. His best win really was against Tony Avalant, who some people will remember boxed um, Anthony Yard and Josh Boazzi, I believe. Um, he's not a fantastic fighter, really, but he gets in with our very own Dan Aziz. He's for the EBU European Light Heavyweight title. I'm going to assume that Azor must be the champion. Yeah, he is. He won it, uh, I think, maybe last time out. Um, Dan Aziz, obviously, on a heck of a run as well. Pretty much cleared up the domestic scene, really. When I say the domestic scene, I mean the fighters that are at domestic level in the domestic scene. Um, you know, I don't... I don't want to sit here and say I think he's one of our top three light heavyweights in the country. He's probably not. But he has done everything correctly. I like the way he's been moved. Um, he's been impressing, you know, every time. Obviously, last time was able to get uh, Rocky Fielding out of there. Um, so, yeah, he gets in here with Thomas Four. I think it's a really, really uh, good opportunity for him as well. Obviously, this one's going to be in France, but it's actually going to be shown on Sky Sports. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to that one on Saturday. Um, all the best to Dan Aziz um, and Lauren Price out there in France. Moving now to the Echo Arena, Liverpool, Merseyside, United Kingdom. Like I say, I touched on it. It's a real shame that... It won't be headlined by Callum Smith. He's out with injury, but the show still goes on. And on the card, let's start with the undercard. We're going to see Campbell Hatton back in action. 9-0, nine and, nine and looking for double-figure wins. He gets in with Mitchell Gonche, who's 4-2 uh, with a draw. Never been stopped, never knocked anyone out. 31 years of age, born in Italy, living in Germany. Um, really... You know, I'm looking through the record. I don't see anything uh, particularly impressive. You know, his wins have all come against uh, guys with losing records, apart from just one guy who uh, isn't that good. Um, his, his two losses came to one was a debutant, one was a guy who was 1-0, and and he drew with a guy who was also a debutant. So this should be really easy pickings for... Uh, for Campbell Hatton, but perhaps he'll he'll uh, get the stoppage, become the first guy to stop this guy. We'll have to see. Talking of guys that need a stoppage, Akib Fiaz as well on the card, ten and zero, yet to get a knockout. He gets in with Dean Dodge, who's nine and two with a draw. Dean Dodge. Um, been stopped the one time, which was last time out to Reese Bellotti. Reese Bellotti a, a little bit limited, really, in terms of his. Um, Arsenal, but certainly he can crack. That's the one thing he does have, really, really heavy hands. And he was able to get Dean Dodge out of there. Like I say, doesn't mean that uh, Fiaz will, will have an opportunity to do it. He probably won't. 
But um, yeah, almost a year out of the ring for Dean Dodge. All the best there to Akib Fiaz, of course. Also on the card, and I'm sure will guarantee a knockout, Johnny Fisher, 7-0, 6 KOs. He gets in with Alfonso Damiani, who's 6-2, and two, the Italian, 37 years of age. Got banged out in three rounds by a guy with a losing record back in 2021, December. And um, he's coming off a win last time out, but again, a horrendous opponent, really, for Johnny Fisher. This is so such a, a step backwards, actually, I'd say, from the likes of, um, well, to be honest, they're still building Johnny Fisher. I'm not even sure who he's boxed, who's better than this guy. I can't. I, I was saying it as if this is a step backwards, but really it's pretty much the same kind of calibre of opponent that he's been in with in recent times. But yeah, Johnny Fisher, always exciting. Uh, Bosch, Bosch, Bosch. And, um, yeah, that's how he fights. Bosh, bosh, bosh. Usually gets a knockout quite quick, and I'm expecting it to be no different here. Um, also on the card as well, good prospect, um, Peter McGraw. He is currently 6-0. and He gets in with Nicolas Botelli, who's 14-7. and That's over 10 rounds there. Botelli from Argentina. Seen the name before. I remember him fighting uh, Sultan Zorbeck. Um can't remember him fighting anyone else, but good stuff for McGraw. It's a decent looking record for him to, to swallow up. Uh, Rhiannon Dixon as well, 7 and 0. She fights here for the vacant Commonwealth uh, title, the vacant Commonwealth uh, lightweight title. She gets in with Vicky Wilkinson, who uh, I think is up from the same the same kind of area, if I'm not mistaken, as Rhiannon Dixon. Could be wrong, but Vicky Wilkinson, 5-0 and with a draw, no knockouts. Somebody's O must go. Rhiannon Dixon, 7-0, and no knockouts. You'd expect it to go the distance. Both ladies, you know, don't have any any knockouts to their names, but it is over 10 two-minute rounds, so we'll have to see. All the best to both ladies there. Don't really have a horse in the race. Uh, it's good, though, for Rhiannon Dixon, who is going to get a TV slot here, I believe, for the first time. And I'm not sure if she would have been on TV if the Callum Smith fight hadn't have fallen through. So opportunity knocks for her. Um, I could be saying this and, and be wrong. She may not be on the TV portion, but um, it's, it's good for her anyway to be on a show like this. I think when when she was like 1-0 and and people found out what she looked like, a lot of people were like, oh, I'm going to be paying attention to her. You know, she she's quite easy on the eye. And, um, you know, she she's done well, obviously, turned pro and, and been, I think, trained pretty much one-on-one -on -one by Anthony Crawler, if I'm not mistaken. So that's great for her. But anyway, good good, good stuff. Good luck for her. Um, yeah, Robbie Davies Jr. I think he was set to take on Liam Paro, if I'm not mistaken. But he pulled out. I could be making that up. But anyway, in steps late replacement. Um, Dara Foley, an Irishman based in Australia. 21-4 and four with a draw. It's over 10 rounds there. Um, Robbie Davies Jr., his record 23-3. and three. Um, I'm expecting... In Robbie Davies Jr. to win, you know, obviously he's had a lot of notice to get into tip-top shape, he was supposed to take on Liam Paro, and he was expected to lose to Liam Paro, but here he's expected to win, and he's a he's a massive favourite with the bookies, um, yeah, I mean, Dara Foley, you know, he's never really been one who's, who's impressed me, um, you know, he's lost over here before as well. Lost to Tyrone McKenna, lost to Akeem Ennis Brown, um, fought Chris Jenkins as well to a technical draw. So, um, yeah, he's never really traveled over here very well. And just, you know, he's, he's, he's obviously based out there in Australia. He's mainly just been fighting Australian guys who weren't that good. So I'm not really expecting much from him. Uh, there's some people that are, you know, saying he could potentially upset the apple cart. But I don't think so. Um, even though Robbie Davies Jr. hasn't been that great of late. I mean, he looked fantastic against Hank Lundy when he banged him out in two rounds. But he wasn't impressive, I don't think, last time against Javier Molina. It's a fight I can't remember too much of despite being there in person for it. Um, but yeah, you know, it, when he lost to Lewis Ritson at 140, that really kind of, uh, made me a bit disinterested with Robbie Davies Jr. No, no, nothing personal with him. I like him. He's a friend of the show. I wanted him to beat Ritson, but when he lost to him and how he lost to him, I thought, wow, like that's, that's the end of the road, really. Um, like I say, he, he did a, a really fantastic, um, 
performance against Hank Lundy. But other than that, it's been a little bit hit and miss. He lost to that Mexican as well um, in, I think, a lockdown show, if I'm not mistaken, um, Gabriel Valenzuela. So he's he's been a bit hit and miss of, of, of recent times, but I still think he's got enough to beat Dara Foley. And the main event, like I say, the, the elevated to main event fight, Diego Pacheco of Mexico, he comes to the UK. It's great to have him over here. I think they've made a fuss of him. They had a, a media workout in the week, and um, I think it was Monday, um, and I, I, I didn't go, but I'm, I'm sure the media showed out for him. Um, very, very exciting prospect, 17-0, and 14 KOs. Um, I think he might be trained by, I want to say he's trained by, I think, maybe um, Jose Benavidez Sr. I could be making that up, but if he is, then it'd be great to have him here as well, obviously. Um, and, and talking of Jose Benavidez as well, I went and saw the Creed Free film the other day, which was a really, really good film, and obviously Jose Benavidez Jr.'s you know, plays a massive part in that film. But anyway, back on track. Diego Pacheco, 17 and 0, gets in with Jack Cullen, 21 and 3 with a draw. It's for the vacant WBO International Super Middleweight title. Jack Cullen, another guy who I think just gets thrown into these these tough fights, you know, fight after fight after fight. Obviously impressed against uh, John Hardin Jr. I don't think he was supposed to win that fight, but you know, boxed him, uh, was was thrown in, managed to win, then gets fed to Felix Cash, gets you know knocked out, stopped. Then he fights Zach Chelly to a split draw, tough fight. Then he gets in with John Doherty, beats him once again. He wasn't supposed to win that fight. That was a cracking win. Then he gets in with Avni Yildirim and put on a brilliant display of boxing that night. I thought it was excellent, actually. Uh, I want to say that was in Eddie's back garden. Um, and then, yeah, after that, loses to Kevin Lee, Sad Joe, uh, gets, gets knocked out by him in Manchester. That was on the Joseph Parker, Derek Chisora 2 undercard, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or 1 undercard. And then, yeah, you know, has a comeback fight and gets in with Diego Pacheco. The only thing that worries me about Jack Cullen is that all three of his losses have been by stoppage, and Pacheco's probably... Mm, yeah, probably the hardest puncher he would have ever been in with. So there's not many people over here giving Jack Cullen a chance. They think that Pacheco is going to just come in and pretty much walk for him and stop him very early. Um, yeah, I mean that. That's. I mean it's probably going to end by stoppage for Pacheco. I'm not sure how early it's going to be, but yeah, it'd be nice to see Jack up, Jack Cullen spring an upset. He's done it many times before, but I'm not sure he's going to be able to do it against someone like Diego Pacheco, who, by the way. You know, some people feel is a little bit overrated. He hasn't had the best opposition. This is probably going to be one of the best fighters he's fought thus far. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a bit of a weird fight, really. It's not one I'd be too confident in, um, you know, betting on or anything. I think I'm going to leave that one to the side. And now moving to the final two cards. We're going to start here with uh, this one. Uh, it takes place at the Kudos Bank arena in sydney uh, Olymp olympic park new south wales australia um yeah this is listed on sunday so i'm going to assume it's probably early hours of sunday morning when i say early hours i mean like 9 a.m uk time it'll probably be crazy o'clock in the u.s but uh, could be wrong on that so so don't take that for gospel but anyway it's a big one, obviously, over here. Let's start with the undercard. A couple fights to mention. We've got Nikita Su, 4-0, uh, getting in with the undefeated 7-0 Bo Belbin, who's, who's yeah, 7-0, that's over six rounds. Uh, there's a good fight, I think, between two fighters as well. I, Isaac Hardman gets in with Rowan Murdoch. That could be interesting there. Um, we've got Sam Goodman. Uh, 13 and 0. He gets in with former world champion TJ Doheny, 23 and 3. That's for the WBO Oriental and the IBF Intercontinental Super Bantamweight titles. All the best to TJ Doheny, man. Uh, good fighter when he had his his moments. You know, he uh, had about a year to two years of being a truly elite fighter, but then obviously lost to um, oh, what's that guy's name? Um, the guy that forgot his name he lost to the guy in Dubai then the guy fought Michael Conlon then the guy fought Liam Davies um, 
Baluta, Baluta, yeah, lost to Baluta, and that was pretty much it. Since then, it's been a little bit hit and miss for him, and it's a shame because, like I say, um, he didn't get much media attention before he won a world title, and he was hot for a minute, but then it all kind of faded away really quickly as well. So, yeah, I feel for him really. Went out there uh, to to MSGs where he beat Takahashi, and it was a real war. Become champion, box Danny Roman it was a fantastic fight, and then yeah, after that hasn't really done much. Obviously, lost to Baluta, lost to Conlon. Um, so yeah, anyway, gets in here with Sam Goodman, who I hope they're not taking TJ Doheny for granted. I don't think he's totally finished. He still could perhaps have enough to beat. Um, Sam Goodman, but having said that, I haven't really seen much of Sam Goodman, but anyway, it'd be a good fight for the undercard there, and then the main event, Eddie, I'm going to come to you, Tim Su, 21-0, it's for the vacant WBO interim world super welterweight title, he steps in with Tony Harrison, 29-3 and with a draw, Tony Harrison these days, uh, I think spends a lot of time being a trainer, obviously training Alicia Baumgardner, I'm sure he puts in his work as well, um, you know, uh, next to her or whatever. Um, coming off a good win last time out when he beat Sergio Garcia, but that was almost a year ago. Um, again, Tony Harrison, you know, it's, it's it's a weird one as well, looking back at his most recent fights. You know, he beat Sergio Garcia, which was a good win. I really rate Sergio Garcia, the Spaniard. You probably wouldn't have seen much of him. But prior to that, uh, he drew with Brian Perella over 12 rounds. That was a split draw. That wasn't a great look. Uh, the fight before that is when he got stopped by Jamel Charlo in the rematch. And the fight before that was when he beat Jamel Charlo controversially. Um, the fight before that, a split decision win against Ishe Smith, who Ishe must have been about 40 at the time. You know, I don't think he's on the best run going into this. And Tim Su, I mean, you know, he's obviously been flying through the Australian scene, beating a lot of guys over there. I don't really read much into that. But the last two fights he's had have been tough fights. You know, he boxed Takeshi Inoue. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a tough fight. He won pretty much every round, but didn't didn't blast him out like he'd been blasting out the Australians. Then he got in with Terrell Gaucher. He was down in the first round. He gets in with Tony Harrison here, who is probably the, the stiffest test of his career. Um... Yeah, it's out of Gaucher and Harrison. It's, it's tight here. But anyway, how do you see it going? It's a long way from Detroit for Tony Harrison. Um, but do you think he can do it? I mean, yeah, there's, there's no question he can do it. It's just a matter of if he's in position to do it, <clears throat> is he going to stay disciplined? Because in my opinion, the second fight with him and, um, Charlo. and Charlo, yeah, he... He was in control. I felt he was up. I felt that he could he could win that fight. I think even better than he won the first, which the first one was kind of controversial. It was you know it's kind of a tough you know back and forth fight. You know for him to get the decision was great, but um, he was I think more in control of the second fight. And then you know he, he gets a little bit too confident. He's in a situation like a lot of guys were with Deontay Wilder, and you can't just think that just because you're better or just because you're in a good position that it can't change in an instant. And I think that's the biggest issue with Tony is that like, especially with those Charlo fights, you cannot put your, you can't give it away. I think he's had another fight where something like that has kind of happened too. Wasn't it with, um, it was with, uh, oh, no, we were just talking about him a little earlier uh, in part one. And he's been looking bad recently. Uh, what's his name? Jesus. Hud. Yeah, Jared Hurd. And I'm like, he was in a situation there where I felt he was supposed to win that fight. Yeah, he was outboxing Hurd. And he ran out. He was outboxing him. And then and, and gave it away. And it's just, you know, Tony is, is, is one of the most talented ones there. He could be the best in the division. He, he has the capabilities. But will he stick to that same plan? Will he, will he be able to finish the fight out? Because you know, Tim Zhu is on a he's on a, he's on a, he's on a streak, regardless of whether it's been you know guys that he should beat or not. He's on a streak. I mean, he got that pedigree behind him with his pop, and you know he's he's he, you know he he's doing good things. You can't just expect just because you're good 
or you may be better skill wise or whatever the situation may be that you want to go in there and be able to just put your hands down and do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. You got to pay attention. You got to respect the game. If, if you don't respect the fighter, that's fine, but you got to respect the game. You know what I mean? Go in there and try to win the fight at all costs. Stop. I'm not saying don't, don't, don't be afraid to lose. Like put yourself in a position to win by not being afraid to lose. But at the same time, don't do anything that you don't need to do. If you're in control, keep control. And without a doubt, I think he can do it. But this kid ain't coming from nowhere. He's like I said, he got the pedigree. He, he's he's expecting to win. He's confident. He's strong. He knows what to do. You know what I mean? He's going he's going to step in there with the idea that he's coming to annihilate Tony. Now whether that happens is up to is up to him. He's got to get in there, and if he gets if he assumes that control, if he starts to get in control, he has to keep it because nobody's going to give it to him. Just because, oh, I beat Charlo once, so what? Nobody care about that. It's, boxing is a what have you done for me lately sport. And Tony got to go in there and do it now. And he got to be solid. You know what I mean? But uh, it's a good fight. Very interesting. He could do it. But uh, Tim Zoo ain't going to give it to him. That's for damn sure. Yeah, and talking of not giving it to him as well, obviously you'd have to worry um You'd have to worry about the scorecards out there in Australia if you're uh, if you're Tony Harrison. Not that I think Australians have been notoriously bad in the past with scorecards. Um, some would say that Manny Pacquiao was robbed, but um, I wouldn't. I, I think that Jeff Horn obviously beat Pacquiao. That was my opinion. But um, yeah, you know they they were they were fair with Devin Haney and uh, and uh, George Cambosos both times. I don't think you actually could uh, could could rob Devin Haney in those ones. But just the fact that obviously Tim Sue is, you know, look who his dad is. You know, he's you know a, a, a legend out there really. And um, there's obviously so much so much power behind. Uh, that that name that surname Sue and um, yeah this is like a darling of of, um, of of Australian boxing and even Australia itself so yeah there's a hell of a lot of uh, of, of people that would be super super upset if he were to lose here so I'm sure they're going to try to do everything they can to make sure he does get the win but Tony Harrison obviously has got the skills has got the tools and I think has the brains as well to win this fight it's just a case of like you say how he travels and can he stick to a game plan for the whole 12 rounds? Tim Su, young, energetic, got a lot of heart. Um, we've seen him get up off the deck, off the deck before and win a fight. Um, so, yeah, it's intriguing, and we're all going to be watching it. It's going to be really good, I think. But, yeah, it's last chance saloon, I think, as well, really, for... Um, for, for, for Tony Harris and this is like now or never for him I think um, I say never obviously he's been a world champion before but I think this is last chance really for him I think he is coming to the end of his days like I say he's got one foot in the door now being a trainer to a world champion female I'm sure he's probably got other fighters as well under his wing so yeah Anyway, all the best to him. He's a friend of the show as well. I think he was on once before, Tony Harrison. All the best to him. Um, but yeah, that is it for that one. The final card to mention is just one card that takes place at the Al Zafar Shrine in San Antonio, Texas, USA over here. I don't think it's going to be televised, but friend of the show, Hector Tanahara, 20 and 1 with a draw. He gets in with John Arellano, who is 10 and 2 with, I think, 9 KOs. Recently, uh, he lost his last fight to Michael Fox. That's over six rounds there. All the best to friend of the show, Hector Tanahara. But that's about it, though, for the preview part of the show. In part one, we did the review part. We welcomed our special guest after that. And then in part two, we did the news, and I've just wrapped up the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 386 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout out to this week's special guest, the undefeated lightweight contender, Gary Cully. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. I did just want to apologize that this week's show has been put out on a Friday rather than a Thursday 
due to unforeseen circumstances we had a delay so again apologies to anyone whose Thursday routine would have been slightly affected a big thanks to our sponsor as well please remember to visit manscape.com and use the promo code boxhard for 20% off plus free shipping but that's about everything from myself enjoy your weekends people stay safe and we shall see you all again next week